production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we're devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. It's Monday, January 29th, and I'm Robin Minter Smyers, a partner at Thompson Hine and the immediate past president of the City Club Board of Directors. I am so pleased to welcome everyone here today for the City Club Forum, which is the Nathu Agarwal and Roy G. Blackburn Forum. This is a very special day at the City Club. Today I have the honor of introducing our speaker, the Reverend Naomi Tutu, a world-renowned race and gender activist. 25 years ago, Reverend Tutu's father, the Nobel Prize winner, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, graced the City Club stage and delivered an impassioned plea for freedom, justice, and tolerance. This may be the first time that both a father and a daughter have been featured speakers at the City Club. <laughs> what an exceptional family legacy. This is a particularly special day for me. 32 years ago, Shortly after graduating from college, I had the opportunity to work for Archbishop Tutu in Cape Town. This experience changed my life, and I am so grateful for this opportunity to reconnect with that experience and hear from his daughter, the Reverend Naomi Tutu. Reverend Tutu has followed in her father's footsteps and blazed her own trail as an activist. Today, we hear about Reverend Tutu's efforts to advance human rights, particularly the rights of women, and to build gender coalitions across racial lines. Prior to accepting the call to the ordained ministry, Reverend Tutu spent years as a development consultant and an educator. Today, she resides in Atlanta, where she is the priest associate at All Saints Episcopal Church. Moderating today's forum is Chi Chi in camera director of strategy and co-founder of Enlightened Solutions. Chi Chi is a Cleveland native and a daughter of Nigeria. In 2021, she released the groundbreaking report Project Noir in response to a 2020 report ranking Cleveland dead last as a livable city for black women. Chi Chi also serves as the chair of Assembly for the Arts, Greater Cleveland's nonprofit Arts Council. If you have a question for our speaker, you can text it to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794, and the City Club staff will try to work it into the second half of the program. Members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming the Reverend Naomi Tutu and Chi Chi and Kenra. Thank you. Well, first and foremost, thank you for coming to Cleveland in January. I know. I know. Yeah. Not too yeah. bright. And, not, and <laughs> especially as the Africans on the stage, we are not even supposed to be here in January. <laughs> um, if you saw us earlier, we were changing our shoes like, oh, God, it's so cold. So, but thank you, uh, seriously, for being here um, and sharing your wealth of knowledge, your experiences and your expertise with us here. Um, I wanna just get off on a good foot and start us off with who is the Reverend Naomi Tutu? I know I asked you in the green room, um, what keeps you passionate? Mm -hmm. What keeps you as a human being passionate doing this work day to day? And um, what keeps me passionate is uh, the knowledge of those who went before me that the people who struggled against apartheid, fought against slavery, 
struggled against colonialism and that many of them took part in those struggles knowing full well they would not see the result of their struggle, that they would not see the end of apartheid. And yet they refused to give up the struggle. Sure. And they dreamt for their children, for their children's children's children. Um, that, and, in, and for me, in particular, I, I always go to my grandparents, um, that my, both my grandmothers were domestic workers, and um, they, would all, they would always say to us, this is not the end of the story. Mm. Apartheid is not the end of the story. And so what you must work for is for a new South Africa. And my, my father's mother died before our dem democratic election, but my mother's mother voted for the first and last time in her life at 91 years of age. Ooh. And... And what she said to me after voting was, you see, I promised you that this day would come. Mm. I believed it would come in your lifetime, but how amazing that I have had the opportunity to vote. Absolutely. And so my passion comes from them. And then my passion also comes from, from, from thinking of my children and my children's children. Mm. And um, I, in particular, I think about um, the, what I want for my son and what I want for my daughter in this world. Yeah. So I want for my son that he can drive in the south of the U.S. without me going through heart palpitations until he arrives at his destination. Sure. And for my daughter, I want a world where she is free to walk anywhere, at any time, dressed anyhow, and be safe yeah. as a woman. And so those are the, the things that keep me passionate and working. Absolutely. So you spoke a little bit about um, us being the manifestation of dreams of our ancestors, our immediate ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, but also just the lineage that we have. And I know in a lot of African cultures specifically, our parents are extremely revered. It's just necessary to be able to look back and reach back and talk about and to fulfill those dreams. Now, um, all of your parents are probably lovely people, but <laughs> we all know that your father, the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, uh, is one of the most, uh, other than just being one of the most famous people uh, that the world has seen, the modern world has seen, uh, but one of the most impactful with his work. Mm -hmm. Now, you as his daughter, mm -hmm. what was that like growing <laughs> up? And I don't use this word because I don't, I don't believe it, not in the shadows, mm -hmm. but continuing that kind of legacy, but also forging your own path. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like to be the daughter of someone like that? But then also, as a feminist, your own person. Right, right. And I, I, I tell people all the time that um, you know, my, my battle with my father started from the day I was born. Amen. <laughs> Um, Terrorize your dads. <laughs> because, uh, because my father was at seminary mm. when I was born, and, um, and a, a family friend, he, so he could not come home. Mm. Gotcha. So a family friend came from Johannesburg to Krugersdorp, and when she uh, went back to report, she said to him, oh, this one, all we need to do is put on a cassock and glasses, and it's you. Oh. <laughs> And so that's been my origin story. And so gotcha. I was determined from the very beginning that there was no way people were going to say I in any way in my actions, words, yeah. resembled my father since I couldn't do anything about the physical, right? <laughs> um, and, okay. and so clearly for me, one of those, the struggle was around ordination and... Mm. Um, and I used to tell people, I don't care if there is no other job available on the planet. I will not, yeah, I can, I can hear the, did you want to turn it off? Okay, thank you. Oh, um, wonderful. 
I will not. So it's, I think it's my earrings. You did warn me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that I, I said, I don't care if being a priest is the last job available on the planet. Yeah. I will not take it. <laughs> that, that will not be me. And, and so I had, in, in growing up, I had that, that determination that I was going to find a path um, to, to making a difference in the world because that was how my parents raised us, mm -hmm. that we were, we were all here to make a difference, but that it was not going to be in the church. Mm -hmm. um, there was no way that it was going to be in the church. And, and so I, I started off as an economist, and I felt that uh, learning about how our economy worked would enable me to be... Um, part of those who change the way our economy works. Mm -hmm. That this, this idea that we can have a, uh, a healthy economy when there are people starving, when there are people homeless, when there are people without access to healthcare, that, that right away for me said, it's not a healthy economy. Yeah. And, and so how did I change that? And then I also was very aware as a black girl growing up that the experiences of women um, in, in society were, were so, were, were different from those of men. Yeah. So again, going back to my own family was that my grandmother was kicked off the farm that she and her husband owned mm -hmm. when my grandfather died because as an African woman, you she was not it. allowed to own property. Yeah. And so, again, for me, the, the battle was how do I, how am I part of the empowerment, the telling of the story of black women um, in uh, a context that, uh, that questioned my humanity as a black person, but also questioned my ability as a woman. Mm. And, 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 and I was fortunate that my parents were very clear that they didn't expect us to follow in their footsteps. And I think that probably they went into shock when I said I was going for ordination, because I was already in shock. Um, <laughs> and, um, but that, they, that, they, that the one thing that they had always said to us was, no matter what it is that you do in the world, it has to be about improving the world, making it a little better mm. than the way you found it. Absolutely. So, yeah. Excellent. So about improving the world, we know that in your life's work outside of ordination, you have a bustling uh, consulting arm. Mm -hmm. You're working within the, uh, in the field of restorative justice, working with, uh, within the field of difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about that work, but specifically, um, are there any passion, um, any initiatives that you've worked on that you're particularly uh, particularly proud of. Mm, mm. So the so Nozizwe Consulting and Nozizwe means mother of many lands, and it was the name that my maternal grandmother gave me. Wonderful. And and so it it seemed to me that that name meant that it was about bringing together many lands mm. uh, and people of many different backgrounds to have conversations based on, not on the pretense that we are all the same, based on the gift of our diversity and the, the, tr the reality of our shared humanity. Mm. And so the work that I have done has been around, one has been about having truth and reconciliation co um, conversations in different communities where there are different conflicts going on, um, whether it be political, religious, um, in, within businesses, um, within communities. Um, and also then to be highlighting conversations that celebrate our diversity and um, at the same time uh, 
highlight our shared humanity. And I think um, one of those that I have been really passionate about, though I have not um, been doing it the, the last few years since my ordination, and in fact, I'm just about to start back up this year, was a, a, a process of bringing together um, groups in this country with groups in South Africa who are doing similar work. So teachers with teachers, um, churches with churches, women's group with women's groups, that kind of, so, so people who are involved in the same kind of work in this country and in the same kind of work and challenges in South Africa and bringing them together to, to recognize the ways that we can learn from one another, mm -hmm. but the ways in which our, um, our context are very different sure. and, and, and that how can we empower each other in our different contexts to do the work and to be um, each other's cheerleaders, if you like, mm -hmm. as, as, as the work gets difficult. And I have to say that the ones that I have enjoyed the most have been the work with women's groups yeah. um, and um, spending the time um, with women saying we are taking this time for ourselves to, to get to know one another but also to, to be about self-care um, both for women from here and, and, and women from South Africa. So yeah, awesome. I'm certain the women in the audience are like, oh gosh, self care, <laughs> a moment for myself. Um, right, right, is necessary. And and we don't, you know, when I first started doing it and said to the women from the U.S. that that part of the focus is self care, mm -hmm. and so many women in this country said, oh no, but I, you know, I do, I do do self care. I I go on vacation. I do this and this and this, and then when we get to our women's retreat saying, this is different. Mm. You know, even when I go on vacation, I'm usually on vacation with family and- You're managing. I'm, I'm managing. Yeah. Where are the towels? Where are we gonna <laughs> eat? No, you do still have a bedtime. <laughs> I, you know? <laughs> That, that, not, that having not rea re realized that even in this time when I say I am resting, mm -hmm. that as a woman, there are still, expe I, I have expectations of myself about the care of everybody else sure. involved in the trip. Mm. So switching gears a little bit, I want to acknowledge uh, that whole global idea that you're talking about, especially global womanhood, um, specifically in the global south. And I want to get this question right specifically, so I'm actually going to read it. So lately, in the last, I would say, probably five to seven years, we've seen a lot of activist movements uh, bubbling up in the global south, and many of them are led by women of color, um, specifically queer women. And I want to kind of dig down a little bit deeper with you around these discussions that are happening globally around body autonomy, abortion rights, education, voting rights, and the connections that we might see here in the US and the connections that we see in these activist movements uh, globally. I don't know if you all are aware, but currently in Kenya, they are marching um, against femicide there is an uptick in uh, the murders of women. Um, and we see a lot of these marching movements here connected here even in the West around, um, around these issues. So I kind of want you to speak a little bit more about that, that global connection right. that's happening with women. And the world, particularly I think the world of media does us a disservice in, in not giving us access to what is going on around the world. Action. 
that um, you know that the, that the highlights that we often see um, would 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 have you believe, particularly about women in the global south, that women in the global south are sitting there being oppressed and and quietly mm -hmm. suffering. Yeah. And and yet when you look from south. Um, to Central America, the, the women who have historically led uh, movements against oppressive regimes. Sure. When you look um, even today around the murders of women happening in South and Central America. When you look around the, um, the movements uh, around female genital mutilation, that it is movements re led by women in the communities where those things are happening. And, and yet the world often sees or highlights um, those who come from the outside mm. to highlight those issues. And so the stories told about, um, uh, about standing up to oppression are often marginalize the stories of, of the women of those countries. Sure. And that we, we so often, in fact, are, are told the stories of white saviors sure. who, who come and, 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 and part of the reason that those are highlighted is because the story of, of whiteness is the story that the media recognizes. They want to center and, it. And that the, the story of, of women of, of color, of, of black, of indigenous uh, people of color, the actions that they are doing, the activities that they are leading, then are, are, are hidden from, from, from the rest of the world. And so for me, part of this work has to be about educating ourselves about who are the people doing the work around the world. And, and it, you know, I, and it's not only, I think, that, that women of the South, that their stories are, 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 are marginalized, that I was, I, I did a presentation uh, a couple of months ago, and I was talking about um, the, the the peace movement in Northern Ireland. Oh yeah, and spoke about Betty Williams and Myron Maguire, oh. who started that movement as a, a Protestant and a Catholic woman. Yeah. And I had a young woman from Ireland say, "I've never heard those names," and I was like. How, how do we talk about the Northern Ireland peace process and never speak about these women who at the time when no men were talking about peace yeah. led the movement? Or how do we talk about the end of the civil war in Liberia and we don't talk about the women's movement that that did the, the biblical sexual fast yeah. to say to their men, nothing happening in the bedroom, honey, exactly. until we see peace. And yet we don't hear those stories, right? Sure. And, and, and so that is, for me, the, the part of the work that people like me who have access to both um, what is happening in the South and have platforms as minor as they might be in, in the global north to make sure that those stories are told. Absolutely. Ooh. That was a word. <laughs> that was definitely a word. Um, I want to ask a little bit more. I know in our conversation last week, we spoke about this trifold intersection that both you and I inhabit, uh, being African here in America, also uh, being black, being black American, and then also being African American. I think I joked with you that when I have children, my children will be African, African American. Um, <laughs> which is why I just say black. <laughs> but uh, we know, especially intraracially, and I'm speaking to the black members within this room, intraracially, mm -hmm. uh, there, are, there is a lot of conflict, mm -hmm. whether it's spoken about boldly, 
-hmm. or whether it's spoken about in hushed tones mm -hmm. between the connection of black Americans that have historically been in this country and built this country mm -hmm. and African Americans, Africans in mm -hmm. America who came on the backs of the civil rights movement um, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and for my parents in the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, those folks who learned from Malcolm X, MLK, uh, mm -hmm. and felt they needed to actualize their dreams here. Mm -hmm. So I want you to speak a little bit about this, this mm -hmm. conflict right. that we see, and many of the under 35 in the room, we see it all the time. We call it diaspora wars on Twitter. It's mm -hmm. this conflict right. between Africans and black Americans. Speak right. a little bit about that. Right. And so um, when I first came to this country, like your parents, I had been raised on the stories of MLK, Malcolm X, Kwame Ture. Yes. So came here ready for the revolutionary sister brotherhood. Your beret was with, on. With black, with black <laughs> Americans. Absolutely. Right, right. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and got to, of course, I mean, I, I ended up in Berea, Kentucky, which is another Girl. whole story, another whole story. And, um, and was shocked to discover that there was this division, that there was the Black Student Union mm -hmm. that was um, mostly black students from the US, and then there was the African Student Association, exactly. yep. which was students from the African continent, mm -hmm. and could not understand the division. And particularly, you know, I would, you know, came here expecting like, you know, my African brothers and sisters, yes. yeah, we're here, we're here. Yeah. Um, and um, met so many black Americans who were like, no, I, I don't identify with Africa at all. And I was like, what? Um, yeah. But then I started seeing how Africa was depicted in this country, mm. right? And so we saw either it was the famine, the wars, the, the, the absolute degradation of people, or else in the movies we had Tarzan, the oh. only brave person on the African continent was a white man. I and I wasn't the allowed Afri to watch that movie, and by the, the way. the <laughs> Africans were all running around crazy. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, hell, I'm not African either. <laughs> if, if that's what African <laughs> is, I'm not claiming it. For real, um, You're so, really funny. <laughs> so you know that that media depiction of what Africa was yeah. made it obvious to me why black people in this country would not want to identify with Africa. Mm. But also, when I spoke to um, students from other African countries, you have to recognize that in South Africa, apartheid made that racial division part of our identity, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're coming from most of the rest of Africa, if you were to, you know, one day bop into the house and say, Mom, I'm black, she would say, yeah, Andrew Slow. Because <laughs> really, that is not an identity. Everybody yeah. around you is, is black. That. So to be a different, that as a differentiation did not make sense. Mm -hmm. And the media depiction on, in, on the African continent of black Americans was also problematic, sure. right? That we were shown African Americans as um, the pimps, the robbers, the, the criminals, right? And so you would have African parents sending yeah. their children to school in the US saying, stay away from black Americans. Yeah. And so then we come together with this suspicion mm -hmm. of one another. That's the word. Right? Yeah. And it's a suspicion of one another that was not a mistake. Mm. Because all of these highlighting of the negativity of Africa or the negativity of black Americans was an outgrowth of a response to the Pan-African movement. Say it. Where leaders 
from the U.S. and leaders from the African continent were coming together and saying our struggle is the, the same. same struggle. Yeah. So that you have Malcolm X saying, we, we, as long as we keep talking civil rights, then our struggle is controlled by the very people who are abusing us. Mm. That we, once we acknowledge that our struggle is a human rights struggle, part of the global human rights struggle, and we take the United States to the United Nations for, its, uh, for human rights abuses, yeah. then our struggle becomes a clearer one. And, and so in response, I think in response to that growing realization in Africa, Asia, Latin America, that the, 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 the struggle for decolonization was a global struggle and that we in the global south had to connect with one another, um, then led to ways of divide and conquer. Mm. And in the context of African and black American, it was making, e making us suspicious of one another sure. and not trusting of one another. And so that you would have um, Africans coming to this country and saying, I am not black, right? Yeah. And which of course makes African Americans say, "So what the hell do you think you are exactly. in this country? Yeah, you you are black. Yeah, you know. And when when the police decide to shoot, they're not gonna ask. Can I hear your accent? Yes. Right. Oh, your Ebo. Oh, you're fine. You're totally right. fine. Yeah, it so, doesn't happen. So so I think that one of the things that is giving me hope is to be seeing the conversations that are happening now amongst yeah. our young, pe uh, young people mm. around the reality of our divisions. Yeah. And most recently, uh, let me just close off with this You're one, fine. is that um, because you know the, the, the artist Tyler oh, from yes. South Africa, um, Give me now, give me water. It's a cute dance. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, came to this country and said, I'm colored. Yes. And I mean, that set off a conversation in this country about what the, who is still calling themselves colored yeah. in 2024? Yeah. And, and, and then to have the conversation that in the South African context, colored is a racial grouping that stands in and of itself. And then people said, well, Trevor Noah never said he was colored. And I was like, because he's not. Yeah. Because he's mixed race. Yeah. He has a Kosa mother and a white father. Tyler has colored parents, colored grandparents, colored great-grandparents, mm -hmm. because that is the way apartheid did it, right? And, and so for us to be now in this conversation around educating one another about our experience of racism and the way that racism changes its, its, its emphasis, sure, depending on where it happens. And depending on where they see potential power, right. I think that's what it is. It's the collective power of black folks here in, in the US uh, Africans in the diaspora and understanding that we are absolutely stronger together. Exactly. We're about to begin the audience Q&A here at the City Club of Cleveland. Awesome. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, a partner at Thompson Hine and the immediate past president of the City Club's Board of Directors. We are joined by the Reverend Naomi Tutu, world-renowned race and gender activist. Moderating the conversation is Chichi and Kremra, uh, co-founder of Enlightened Solutions. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those joining via our live stream at cityclub.org. If you'd like to text a question for our speaker, please text it to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794.
and the City Cub staff will try to work it into the program. May we have our first question, please. Good afternoon, Reverend Tutu, and thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Thank you. Reconciliation, I find to be a very difficult concept. So would you talk to us a little bit about the process of truth and reconciliation as it began in South Africa? And then a second question, what is the state of reconciliation in South Africa today? Mm. Mm. So, um, you know, our Truth and Reconciliation Commission was actually part of our interim constitution. So it was a negotiated um, co commission that on the one hand, we had people in South Africa who were saying, you know, if we want to start uh, fresh, we just wipe the slate clean and, and move on. <laughs> and then there were others who were saying, no, you, there's no way you can wipe the slate clean. We need to have Nuremberg-style trials for human rights atrocities. And so the TRC was actually uh, a compromise position that said, uh, we're not giving a blanket amnesty. If you want to receive amnesty for human rights abuses, you have to appear before the commission and tell the truth of, of your actions and show that they were politically motivated and, and then the, the amnesty committee will make a, 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 de a, a determination as to whether you qualify for amnesty. Um, so, so that was one part of the commission, was hearing the applications of those who were perpetrators of human rights abuses. Another part was the, the Human Rights Committee, which I think most people here were most familiar with because that was the one that was the most televised, which was the, the ones that were chaired by my dad very often. Uh, and those were the opportunity for those who were victims and survivors of human rights mm -hmm. abuses to come and tell their stories um, to, to, to the commission and, and, and then to be designated as victims and survivors in order to qualify for from the third part of the committee, which was the reparations committee, um, to, to receive reparations from the committee. And uh, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to, to talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because our dinner table, when, I, when my dad was the chair, we had many, many discussions about what I saw were the failings of, of the commission. Wow. Having said that, I, 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 I give honor to South Africa for trying a different way out of conflict, a way that did not um, set the seeds for another conflict in, mm. in that process. Mm. And, I, and I think that in that way, it did, it did succeed. I think the failings were that, um, that in the end, our government largely ignored the, the, the recommendations of the reparations committee mm. in terms of what were the reparations to be given to victims and survivors of human rights abuses. Because the reparations committee had made suggestions around education, housing, job um, training opportunities that would allow those who had suffered the most under apartheid to build new lives um, in a democratic South Africa. And it also then did not follow through in um, charging those who were found not to qualify for amnesty or who did not apply for amnesty for the, the, the crimes that they had committed. So those two, I think, were our, the greatest failings of the commission. I think the greatest strengths of the commission were, first of all, in the cases where people told the truth, where we got to hear what had happened to people who had disappeared. Mm -hmm. Family members got to hear from those who had actually murdered their loved ones. Those who had been tortured got the opportunity to question their torturers. So that I think in bringing up the truth, I think that, that we had 
um, a, a, that that was a, a major achievement of the commission. And then the second was to hear the stories of those who were victims and, and survivors, to hear from them what their experience meant for themselves, for their families, um, and, and to have that then as part of the story of South Africa so that we as South Africans cannot pretend that apartheid never happened, right? Mm -hmm. That we cannot d decide that we, our history books are going mm -hmm. to take out stories of massacres and kidnappings and torturing because they make people uncomfortable. Mm. Because we mm. have that report that is a government report that is now the basis of stories that we, we, we tell. Wow. Um, and, and also that we then cannot pretend that South Africa's story is simply a story of heroes. Mm. That our story is not simply the story of Nelson Mandela and Stephen Biko and Walter Sisulu and, and the, the, the Hector Petersons, the hundreds who gave their lives, but it is also the story of um, Vutar Basun. It is the story of Eugene de Kock, who was named Prime Evil. It is the story of those who, um, who led death squads, and it is in our history, in a government commission that people can then not rewrite as it pleases them. Wow. And the, the, state of South, the state of reconciliation in South Africa today? Pardon? The state of reconciliation in South Africa Oh, today. yes, sorry. Um, it is an ongoing struggle. I mean, we, we are 30 years old. We will be celebrating 30 years of democratic elections this year. Wow. And we have people like me who were raised under apartheid. And so we have people like me with white skin who were raised under apartheid, who were taught, who were indoctrinated into their superiority as white people over black people. And so the, the process of education and reconciliation is an ongoing struggle to, to this day. Okay, thank you. Immigration to the United States is a very contentious topic right now. I was just wondering, through your foundation, have you done any work in terms of bringing people who immigrated to the United States and people already here together to learn do from each other and to reduce the fear? Mm. No, not, not, through my, not through any work, official work that I have done. Um, I am a first generation immigrant to this country myself. And, um, and I, I think that the, the, the discussion around immigration tends to happen in a historical vacuum in mm. this country. Um, that we, we talk as though these United States came into being when God created the world, <laughs> right? That, that this, is a, this is an original creation. Mm. When we know that this United States came into being through colonization, through the, the, the genocide, the forced removal of indigenous people, mm. through the um, enslavement of African people, through the Louisiana Purchase, through, I mean that there is a whole history that has brought us to where we are today. And if we have a conversation around immigration that ignores that history, then we are able to have a conversation about immigration that says, I came here legally. How did, you know, why are they trying to get here illegally? Well, what, what was legally when your ancestors came here? 
and who was displaced for your ancestors yeah. to be comfortable. <laughs> and when we talk about these United States as being part of the larger Americas, where people moved around these Americas, um, that we have, we have borders that are man-made. People, mm. we made these borders. And, and we, when we talk about immigration so often in this country, I feel that we, we talk about it as though this country does not continue to benefit from the work of immigrants. And, and one of my dreams, one of my dreams, do you, do you all remember the, there was a play, I can't remember its name, but it was a play where in a city one day all the blacks disappeared? Oh, yeah. The day of absence, yeah. right? And nothing happened. People <laughs> didn't know how to cook, people didn't know how to wash clothes, people didn't know how to look after their children. So I have a dream of one day every single person who is identified in this country as illegal does mm. not go to work. Ooh. And let us see what happens in this country. Wow. Let us see the hotel rooms, the hospital rooms, the, what does not happen in this country. So if we're going to talk about illegal immigration, let's have a whole conversation about who is benefiting and who is actually being marginalized in this conversation. talked a lot about the importance of stories and my question today is what do you think the censoring of history in American schools will do to the next generation? Woo! Sat. <laughs> so I was kind of hinting at that <laughs> when I was talking about the Truth and Reconciliation yeah. Commission. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know I I, I used to teach at the University of Hartford in Connecticut, and I was amazed the number of students when I asked them, what is it about the black experience that you are most interested in hearing about? What is it that you want to learn about? The number of young people who said, I want to learn about slavery. So at that point, I was still fairly new to this country and had not had the experience of a K through 12 educational system. And so I was in shock. Like, you're in college and you only now are wanting to hear about slate. What were you doing during history and social studies K through 12? Were you skipping class? What? And then I had children in K through 12 in this country and discovered that in good history books, the, his, uh, the history of slavery was covered in a chapter. That was the good history books. Is this in the wrong most time of it, for... it was a paragraph. Yeah. And so we are already in a place where history has been rewritten mm -hmm. in the interest of, 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 of a history of heroes a history of the positive acts that have created this United States of America. So we are already suffering, I think, from, from that, th that perspective. And what we have happening now is only going to lessen the, 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 the access that our, the next generation has to official history that tells the true story of the US. And I say official history because one of the things, again, that is heartening to me is to see the number of places where young people are starting banned book clubs, where they are making it their, their own mission to discover what is, 
Yeah, I, yes. He has a shirt, he, yeah. We love that sweatshirt <laughs> that, that they are making it their, their mission yeah. to understand what is it that is being hidden from us and why is it being hidden. And I, I trust and I pray that young people will not get tired of doing that and that they will find mentors and people in our age group, well, maybe the younger, <laughs> the, the age group that comes after me because I'm y'all's grandmothers. So, but your parents who will mentor and encourage you to research what is being hidden from you in school. Mm. That education does not just happen in the classroom. Yeah. And the fact that, that indigenous people continue to tell their stories, the fact that black people continue to tell their stories, that this is not because they have been in history books. It is because the community has made it its responsibility to tell our children the stories. And I hope and I pray that white Americans will join in that movement uh, against, uh, the join in the movement of banned book clubs and telling the true history to your children as well as ours. Hello, my name is Kayla. I'm a senior at Beaumont. Um, my question is as follows. I'm sure that you get a lot of criticism as an activist, not all of it being constructive. Could you describe a time where you experienced such negative criticism and how you battled that? Ooh, that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and I was warned about young people's questions. <laughs> they, they warned me. They said, watch out. Um, so uh, while I was living here um, as a student, um, the, which was the, 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 as the sanctions movement was, um, was, was, was growing in this country. When I, when I first arrived, there was not a sanctions movement, um, a, a, not a widespread sanctions movement. And so I became part of a student movement to, um, to push um, colleges, universities, pension funds to disinvest um, funds from the work that, uh, from companies that were doing business in apartheid South Africa. And I, I got criticized a lot by people even in our, uh, my church community um, about people telling me that, uh, you know, if divestment happens, the, the first people to suffer will be black people. And so for me to be calling for sanctions as somebody who is living fairly comfortably in the US of A um, as a student and whose parents um, had the wherewithal to send me to boarding school in neighboring countries, that it was somewhat, um, it was, very privileged of me to, to be saying, uh, giving a call for sanctions against South Africa. And my response at that time was, have you seen how black people are living today in South Africa without sanctions? Have you seen how my people are being killed? Have you seen how people's communities are being destroyed so that land can be given to white people? Have you seen how black people are starving in the Bantu stands in South Africa? Have you seen how my people are being arrested, shot, tortured in South Africa without sanctions? So my people are already suffering. And my people right now are suffering for the profit and the well-being of the apartheid state. And it's not that we say we will not suffer through sanctions. We know full well that we will suffer 
through sanctions. But at least that will be a suffering that is towards our liberation. The suffering that we are going through right now does nothing but privilege white South Africans and empower the white South African military to continue its violence against us. First of all, I'd like to say it's an honor to see you talk Thank literally. You. And I'm Leah Williamson, I'm a senior from CSA, Cleveland School of the Arts. And seeing that texturism, colorism, and even featureism have been a problem recently and always have been, would you say that this is one of the largest forms of division between not only white and the black population of the world, but just the black community as a whole, like intertwined in our com community, other than the outright acts of division tactics? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gen Z. I told you. <laughs> They're not giving me easy questions. At all. <laughs> and, and again, I think that we, it's a conversation that we also, we, we also need to have in context, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, the context, the most obvious context is South Africa, where um, we, we, because of apartheid, and we were taught that proximity to whiteness was the goal as, as black people. That, um, you know, that it, we, we, we talked about our children with pretty good hair, with the good hair. And we talked about, oh, that one is beautiful, she's light-skinned, even though the child was, mm, you know, we needed to pray to God for the child. But just because they had a light skin, we were convinced that the child was you, you going to win. Going to win. No, I did not call the child, the child ugly. ugly. I did not say. Because there is no ugly child. Okay. But, but you, know, you know, God made that child light skinned, but not okay. <laughs> But that we had, we had that for us in South Africa, and I recognize that that has also been the reality here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. That proximity to whiteness, that we, you know, we that just like they had people in this country who passed, we had the same thing in South Africa. People who who coloreds who passed as white, and Africans who passed as colored because that was proximity to power, right? And we, we, can, we can look throughout the world and see that the way in which um, media, film, everything has been portrayed, it has centered whiteness as the most valuable asset, right? Whether it be good hair, or pinched nose, uh, uh, you know, whatever it has been, it has been that beauty has been based on whiteness. And therefore, it is not a mistake that we are still to this day having to battle within our communities the to battle to say, uh, oh, you, you pretty for a dark one. It's like, ma'am, did you just say that to me? Yeah. And you looking just like me. <laughs> but that it is, it has been a historical indoctrination. And for the historical indoctrination to end, we have to first acknowledge the fact that it is real and then to be willing to have the conversations and to be challenged at the times when we, when we fall back into that centering of whiteness as the, the core beauty. Thank you to Reverend Chuchu and Chichi Nkrumah for joining us at the City Club today.
Forums like this are made possible thanks to the generous support of individuals like you. And you can learn about how to become a guardian of free speech at cityclub.org. Today's forum is the Nathu Agarwal and Roy G. Blackburn Forum, established in memory of Mr. Agarwal's and Mr. Blackburn, who set inspiring examples and exhibited a lifelong commitment to education, in particular, women's and girls' education. We are very grateful for the support of the City Club member, Raj Agarwal, and his family, who have made this annual forum possible. We would like to welcome students joining us from Beaumont School, the Cleveland School of the Arts, Hathaway Brown School, MC Squared STEM High School, and St. Martin de Porras High School. Don't they ask the best questions? And we'd also like to welcome guests at the tables hosted by Enlightened Solutions, the Shaker Heights City Schools, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, Trinity Episcopal Cathedral, and the YWCA of Greater Cleveland. Thank you all for being here today. This Friday, February 2nd, the City Club will welcome Emily Campbell, the new president and CEO of the Center for Community Solutions, as part of our Local Heroes series. You can learn about this forum and others at cityclub.org. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you all, thank you members, Friends of the City Club, I'm Robin Minter Smyers, and this forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.